Welcome to um, this PowerPoint on narrative critical theory for AQA um, English Literature A-Level preparation for NEA coursework. So today we're going to look at a few aspects of narrative theory I think might be particularly useful for you when preparing for your coursework. Um, we're going to look at some key terminology. Uh, we're going to look at types of narrative structure, chronological or non-linear. We're going to look at narrative voice, why that's important. Um, looking at first and third person narration and also looking at unreliable narrators. We're going to look at narrative gaps, why they exist, what their purpose is, how we can fill them. And we're also going to look at um, how setting is used in um, narratives in order to give um, a sense of verisimilitude and how settings are used to also create meaning. So when we're thinking about time, there's sort of two things to think about here. The time within the story, like the time frame it's told, is it told over the course of a year? Um, does it go back in time? Um, and we're also thinking about context as well, how the author manages the time around the story. So for example, you know, the setting in Venice in the 15th century of Othello. So there's two different aspects to that. So some of the things that we need to think about are um, the time, as I said, that the story is taking place, the kind of time frame, which might be in contemporary times, it might be a modern story set in the modern day, or it might be a story that is um, set in the past or the future. And in that instance, it's important that the author incorporates details um, that make it a convincing text for that time. So, for example, if you set a, a story in Victorian times, you'd have to have a sense of how society worked then. Um, if you set a novel in the future, so some kind of dystopian text, you'd have to sort of work out how that society um, lived and worked in order to make that um, setting in this new time sound convincing. So it doesn't always work to tell a story in chronological order. For example, if you um, just tell the story from beginning to end, um, it can be a little bit predictable or even dull. So using a non-linear structure, a structure that kind of hops around a bit in time, can let the author tease out revelations. They can tell you things about the past in the middle of the story that you didn't know. Um, they can grab your attention in the opening with a really exciting flashback or flash forward in time um, to an exciting event. Then when they've got your attention, they can fill in the exposition. So the exposition is sort of all the explanation of the story, who everybody is, what's happening later on because you're already hooked. So a good example of that would be Harry Potter, the first story. The first story starts with a flashback. We go to McGonagall and Dumbledore at Privet Drive watching Harry being taken into the house. We're given this kind of mysterious situation, this woman who can change into a cat. They're talking about some huge fight that's just happened and they're emphasising the importance of Harry. Then we flash forward in time 11 years to when Harry's grown up. Why do we do that? Because that hooks us in and makes us want to know more about Harry. We don't need the 11 years of Harry growing up because until his, until his magical powers started, it wouldn't have been a very exciting story. So you might think that a detective story is the kind of classic story that needs to follow a linear narrative, so not too much is given away. Um, but there are actually lots of different ways that a detective story can work. So um, it could start with the planning of the murder, then you have the body found, then you have the detective um, pursuing the case, finding out clues, maybe having some red herrings, going down the wrong line, but finally identifying the killer. Then that revelation where the killer is confronted, perhaps they're killed, um, perhaps they're arrested, um, etc. But actually, you don't have to do it like that. One of the books that we're going to read next year, um, Kate Atkinson, When Will There Be Good News, starts with um, a flashback to the past, 20 years from when the rest of the text takes place. And um, it begins with this violent, awful murder. But then it really hops around in time. Um, so it goes much further into the future. We're not really sure how the crime that we see in the opening pages is linked to the crimes that are happening um, in the present day. 
So what I'd like you to think about is, could you just do an outline for a, a detective story, a crime story, in which you play about with the time, with the um, narrative? You don't just have a straight narrative. Write down a few ideas. Which of them do you think would be the most effective? So chronology then is a way of the author um, influencing impact on the reader. So they can use it to focus um, our attention on certain aspects of a character. Uh, the action is foregrounded. It creates suspense because there are kind of gaps in the narrative that we don't necessarily understand till later on. So think about something like The Great Gatsby, that opening chapter is a kind of flash forward in time when Nick is reflecting on um, you know, his sort of history with Gatsby and what happens to him. He um, foreshadows Gatsby's eventual fate and the tragedy to come. And then the story um, goes forward in time to the present day um, and his kind of initial meetings with Daisy and Tom and Gatsby. But we also have flashbacks in the rest of the narrative. For example, we have that kind of flashback to um, Daisy and Gatsby's um, meeting towards the middle of the text. So how do we apply this aspect of narrative theory to our coursework? Well, we might look at a text that um, experiments with a non-linear narrative. Um, for example, Wuthering Heights. Um, Wuthering Heights sort of starts in the present day with this ghostly figure knocking at the door. Um, we later find out this is Catherine Linton, her restless ghost coming back um, to haunt the moors and her lover Heathcliff. And then we flash back in time to when Heathcliff was first brought to the house and we find out um, about how Heathcliff and Cathy's relationship um, progressed until we come back to the present day. And by then we understand a little bit more about why Heathcliff behaves in the way that he does. Um, he lost the love of his life and it has embittered him and destroyed him. So first person um, narrative voice, obviously where you're using the I, um, is a way of getting a really intimate account of a story. You can get a real sense of the character's inner thoughts and feelings. It's a very personal account. Um, but of course, um, an issue with that is that you aren't able to um, get as much of an insight into what other characters are thinking and feeling. Um, so a novel like Rebecca, for example, the first person narrative voice is really, really important. The unnamed narrator um, is our guide through this world that she doesn't understand. And because she doesn't, we don't really either have a really, really clear sense about what's going on. And that adds to the sense of kind of intrigue and mystery. She's in the dark, so we are as well. So an unreliable narrator is a narrator that we can't completely trust. That might be because they're being dishonest and deceiving us about things. Um, a classic Agatha Christie novel, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, the narrator is deliberately lying to the, the reader all the way through the text. Um, a novel like Rebecca, uh, the unnamed narrator isn't necessarily lying to us, um, but she doesn't have a full understanding of what's going on. She's very naive, things are hidden from her, and also perhaps she hides things for herself, from herself because she fears to face the truth and the reality of what's going on. Um, an un sorry, unreliable narrator um, like Nick in The Great Gatsby is unreliable because although he thinks he's honest, we suspect that actually he isn't always honest. Um, he has um, negative feelings about certain characters um, in the novel and this colours and distorts his um, version of events and his vision of them, which is the only one that we get. Um, and his bias against certain characters also is um, part of the text. So we can only see what Nick sees and that isn't always necessarily the truth. Nick sometimes imagines things, a bit like the narrator in Rebecca, that he thinks might have happened or could have happened. And he tells us that like it's a truth. But of course, it isn't. It's only his perspective, um, his imaginings, his beliefs.
sometimes an author refers to um, real places, maybe in quite a lot of detail, like in Dickens. Um, so real cities, even real street names or um, real pubs or shops. And this creates a sense of verisimilitude. It gives us a sense of reality, like um, the events that are happening are real and tangible and can be placed.